My name is Ron Williamson. I was wrongfully convicted of the murder of Debbie Carter. My name is Ronald Jones, and I was convicted of a crime that I didn't commit in 1985. I'm the brother that just got through doing 17 years for a crime that I did not commit, which was a serial rapist, the tiff farm serial rapist. My name is Clyde Alton Charles. I was convicted of a crime that I didn't do, aggravated rape. I spent 19 years in Louisiana State Penitentiary for a crime that I didn't do. And it was hell. It was a nightmare. They're not telling me why they're detaining me. All I got is an open can of beer. God damn, it ain't like I had a gun or nothing. Once you poured the beer out, you should have gave me my ticket and sent me on my way. But no, you're going to wait around two or three hours and wait for another police car to come up. Y'all get to whispering. Next thing I know, they want to take my picture. Take my picture for what, man? We just need to take your picture. Uh, my photograph was displayed, and uh, she said that I looked like the guy that did it, that I was awfully close. She said that she couldn't be positive, but she thought I was him. And uh, they put my hair in a ponytail, and then they took a, a bowl of water, and they took, the detective took me by the wrist, and he kept dabbing my hand in the water and slicking my hair back with the, with the water. Then he did it the other hand, and he slicked my hair back with the water. And um, I didn't care because I was in it. I, I figured no way, no way anybody could pick me out of a lineup. It's, it's impossible. I was home in bed with my wife and kids. This can't happen. And because the police coached her with a Polaroid snapshot saying, we think this is a guy, they actually brainwashed that woman into thinking that shit was me. That's not, man. When they told me that she picked me out of the lineup, the victim pinned me out in the lineup, he said. It's like I started screaming, how could this be? I was home in bed with my wife, go ask my wife and kids, and nothing mattered. <clears throat> nothing mattered. You don't have to, if you're not guilty, what you got to worry about. So at the time, you know, I'm feeling like, you know, well, I know I didn't do it. So eventually, you know, I, you know, the, the truth should come to light. I didn't like the looks of the jury the moment they got, they receded. It seemed that the, we never could get anybody on there we really liked. and. Uh, I don't know, halfway through the trial, one of the women on the jury stuck her tongue at me and made a face tour at me, so. <laughs> yeah, she just sort of, real quick like that, because I looked at her too long, I guess, so. There was no blacks on my jury. None. Not none. How are you going to be a jury of my peers? I'm 26 years old at the time. Everybody on my jury at least 35, 40 years old. Those are not my peers. During that trial, we listened to the prosecution prove I was innocent, prove that I was somewhere else, prove that the murder weapon wasn't the murder weapon, proved my defense uh, 100%. The jury heard only Diane saying it was me. She had been uh, assaulted with a ketchup bottle. Uh, she had been... Uh, written on with the word die printed on her chest in pink finger polish. And uh, she had been contused and bruised about her face. And uh, she had been strangled with an electric cord and a, a bloody washcloth had to be removed from inside her throat. And so uh, it was especially heinous, atrocious, and cruel. When the people said that, the woman said that the man had a large gap in the top of his teeth and teeth larger than average with dark gums. My lawyer did this to me. Lady, what color is these? I, they said, Mr. O'Donnell, would you please, please rise for the verdict? <clears throat> and they stood up and uh, they all, I don't know, I never seen this before on TV or anything, but all of them had to say guilty. They all had to 
say their verdict. And they said, guilty, 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 12 of them. And I just stood there, and I couldn't even talk. I couldn't even say nothing. And I turned around, and I looked at my wife, and my father, and my mother, and my neighbor. And, uh, and I just stood there, and I, and I took a deep breath, and I just started screaming at the top of my lungs. How could you fucking live with yourselves? I didn't do anything. I was home in bed with my wife and kids. The trial was over in my case. The girl father came over to me and he shook my hand. He said, for, for, for one poor black man, you put up one hell of a fight. And I looked at him and I said, mister, I did not rape your daughter. And he just lightly just eased on away. And I looked at my mom and dad, I said, now, he think the fight is over with. The fight just begun. You know, I'm on death row with names such as John Wayne Gacy and uh, all these other type of guys that's on death row. And here I am right next door, next, next cell to them, you know. And it was just unbelievable to me. My life was threatened every day. Just think about going through that for uh, almost nine years. Uh, man, I'm going to kill you, man. When I, get, when I get the chance, I'm going to kill you. And I could have been my sister that you raped. Child molestation, rape, and snitching to get you killed quicker than anything else in prison. But it just so happens that I happen to be a lifer, and lifers got prestige in prison, you know? So, you know, once they found out I had life, you know what I'm saying, the, the question of what did you get life for was actually never brought up. And the only ones that actually ever knew that I was in prison for rape were a couple of my cellies and a couple of my friends that I made. I was challenged because of my crime, why I was there. Um, a man took a jar of coffee from me, and in that society, that meant I had to either kill him or let him kill me, or I'll just allow everybody to come along and take anything they wanted from me, anything they wanted. You know, when you're in Rome, you got to do like the Romans do. And that's what I did. I knew nobody was in prison for being good, whether they were innocent or not. They put them in there because they thought they was bad. So even if you wasn't bad, you got to look and act bad. So, you know, I just said, OK, now, Douglas, you're in Rome. We used to steal metal trays from the kitchen and sew them into our pea coats on the sides and on the back and in the front. Then you would take your little watch cap, like a beanie cap, and you'd get it wet and just stretch it out as long as you could. Then you'd take some newspapers and fold them up and just shove them through there and make a collar. You'd be going through chow or something, you'd tink, tink, tink. You know what I'm saying? People trying to stab you and shit. That's how violent that shit was. The guy was here and was pushing, and I felt the when I closed my eyes, and that was stupid, but I did, and I felt the pressure right here. I felt it. And uh, the other guy said, guard is coming, guard is coming. And he pulled away, and I was, I just fell to my knees, and I was just start shaking all over, you know. An officer grabbed this leg, one grabbed this leg, an officer grabbed this arm, the other one grabbed this arm, and the fifth one stepped between my leg and kicked me in my groin until I bleed from the mouth. And the tax dollar paid for that. Uh, one guy and I had envisioned, you know, trying to get a hold of old uh, Marine buddies and having a helicopter gunship come in and land in the in the yard and take out the towers and you know, we'd escape. But all that's fantasy. All that's just a way to try to stay sane. Hell no, nobody can serve a life sentence. 
That's till you die. With dead man walking around looking at the graveyard. I asked myself what was the reason for my birth when I was on death row, if I was going to have to go through all that, you know, what was even the reason for my birth, you know. I almost cursed my mother and dad, it was so bad for putting me on this earth. Everything was totally out of control, all the pain, I couldn't do anything about anything, and I decided that the only control I had was whether I continued to live, continued to breathe. So I decided one day while sitting at work, after not being able to stop my hands from shaking, that I would go back to my wing, go up to the third tier and jump off the tier and see if I could fly. I tied a sheet, put it around my neck and tied it, and then I was thinking about jumping. And the uh, captain came down there and told me that uh, it wouldn't be good for my family to see something like that and talk to me out of it. I almost felt like giving up, you know, uh, going off or going crazy or insane or whatever. But at the same time, uh, <clears throat> I was the only one fighting my case. So if I slip off into that, uh, lost my mind, lost my sanity. I wouldn't have had no one else to fight for me. A lot of time I couldn't read, couldn't write too well. Go to my friend, listen, man, I got a problem. Help me out with this, y'all. Help me to correspond with different people, senators, representatives, different lawyers. Every time I hear something come up dealing with new law, Go there, get some boys, we go to the library, look up cases and stuff. And I would just write frivolous shit, just so it would be in the court. You know what I'm saying? Man, somebody got to listen. I didn't exhausted every remedy I got. I went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court and was still turned down. And basically, the technology had to catch up with my case, and that's all. Basically. That's about the only way you can describe it. Technology had to catch up with the case, and it finally did. Being uh, convicted of rape, I knew that if I had an opportunity to take DNA tests, the truth would come to light. So I gave it, you know, when I realized he was going to do DNA testing, and I had been trying for several years, six years, seven years, to get somebody to do DNA testing, I stuck out both arms. I knew I'd get a hold of that evidence one way or the other, and I'd use it. The city of San Diego had me retested. Came up to the prison, drew blood, took photographs and fingerprints, had me retested. And then as I was going out, uh, the prosecutor at the time, he gonna tell me, uh, Mr. Day, uh, I wish you luck, good luck. Motherfucker, this ain't got nothing to do with luck. You know what I'm saying? This is a DNA test. That shit ain't based on luck. Either you are or you ain't, bottom line. I said, is it good news or bad news? And she goes, it's good news. I said, just tell me. And she says, they finished the DNA testing, they found a male DNA, and it didn't match yours. I am the luckiest. Oh my God, flip a coin, I turned up Eric. And two days later, on the 20th of June, 1996, uh, two detectives from the Orange County, uh, the Orange County District Attorney's Office uh, arrived at Soledad to escort me out. And my TV, and my TV and my box of possessions in my hand. You know, and I check for uh, about $900 from the state or something that I'd saved up. I got on the truck, loaded it all up, and I said, do what I asked you? And he goes, yep, yeah. open up the glove compartment, pack of Marlboro's, lighter. 
He goes, now don't go crazy on that. And roll down your windows and don't get any ashes on my sheet. The only time I, the first time it, it, it really slapped me in the face, I was going down the freeway in a car. With the windows rolled down, the radio blasted, and the wind was blowing, and I just, I, I, I started crying. Because I felt free. You know what I'm saying? And I said, I'm free. My mother is about the only one that I really wanted to see, to see me be released. But that didn't happen, you know, because she died while I was there, you know. And so hopefully wherever she at, you know, she's seen. Hope she could have lived to see that day, boy. My mama would have been so happy cried and hugged me and kissed me and whoo. I don't even want, I don't want to talk about that. That's probably the biggest loss. I never got to say goodbye. My dad couldn't talk to me the last couple of years. My mom, she was mad out of it mentally, so that was probably the hardest part, getting through that. I did get to see her funeral on, on video, so I can go see that again whenever I want. But. I was more scared to come home than I was to stay there, if that makes sense. I, I, that's exactly what went through my mind. And when I came home that night, um, <sighs> I don't know, thinking about it, I'm scared right now being home. It's great to have the freedom to walk around, to pick up the phone and not have to call collect to, to, to your family, you know, or, or to just go roaming somewhere. It's, it's good to have that freedom, but it's just too much freedom. I, I'm not used to this much freedom. Uh, I find myself second-guessing myself, apologizing, explaining, and re-explaining, and making sure that someone's there to hear my explanation, you know, and keeping records and tabs on where I was and what I was doing and how long I was there. Because sometimes I spit on the ground and say, well, maybe they got scraped at it and put it on a crime scene or something. And they had me jack a lady in a cup and said the vial got broke. And then they came back and got blood and all this other stuff. You know, there's a lot of me still out there somewhere. You know, I, that's why I really don't like going nowhere. I mean, don't get me wrong. I have to go places, but I really don't be wanting to go because of, I mean, I, anything could happen. You know, anything could happen to me, man. I mean, I just, I want to hurry up and get there so I can have as many alibis as I can when I get there. And I want to make it there in no time flat. I try to live like before, but I can't live it 